Well, thank you, Joseph. I greatly appreciate it. And welcome everyone to the last, the final desktop workshop of 2024 for personal liability when driving your government-owned vehicle. My name is Devin Beckus, and I'm a fleet service representative working with the Pittsburgh Fleet Management Center, and I'm based out of Central PA at the Harrisburg Field Office. Welcome. A lot of stuff to cover here. And uh, like Joseph was saying, we've got Q&A. You got questions, go ahead and ask. We're going to get to every single question either during the presentation or after. And then if there's any questions that you might think uh, are a little bit too complex for you, uh, or for this session, I'll have my email. Feel free to send me an email, either call or I'll email you back. So let's get started. So what happens if you cause a vehicle accident while driving a government-owned vehicle? A few questions you might have. Number one, can I be sued? Hmm, good question. Am I covered by any type of insurance? And then the last question you might have, do I have the right policies in place to protect my employees? All good questions. But the reality is today's ultimate question is, are you personally liable if you're involved in a motor vehicle accident while driving a government vehicle and you're at fault? Now, this includes all government vehicles, whether they're GSA leased, whether they're agency owned, whether they're tactical, non-tactical, or special purpose vehicles. And an example of a special purpose vehicle that's actually also a tactical vehicle is the U.S. Army M1142 tactical firefighting truck. For those of you that may have been in any of my past sessions, I am a retired Air Force firefighter, and I'm a currently a, a volunteer firefighter, so I, I've got a lot of fire pictures in here. So, But also, if you happen to work for the U.S. Army School of Music and you drive GSA buses and stuff, this applies to you as well. So to my buddy Phil out there who's at this session, yes, it applies to you just as well. So hold on. Here we go. Personal liability disclaimer, this information provided in this presentation does not constitute legal advice as any such advice would need to be based upon an analysis of law applied to specific facts by your agency. And for specific guidance, contact your agency fleet manager and or your agency's general counsel, the legal office, because each agency may handle liability a little bit differently. And if you happen to be looking at this presentation based on a YouTube search, look for the most recent posted presentation it has the most current and up-to-date information. Why is this training important? Well, two reasons. Number one, knowledge is power. The more you know and understand about the liability topic, the better you can protect yourself and your agency. And then always on offense, okay? Always on offense. Irv Caller, guy I met, real good person, gave me this line. He says, Devin, always on offense. Because when you're on offense, you're better prepared to meet the challenges of your everyday operations. And you don't ever have to worry about being on defense. We're going to talk about both here in a little bit, and uh, we're going to get into quite a bit. Chris says, please discuss differences between agency-owned vehicles and GSA vehicles. Do the requirements of use ever differ between GSA and other agencies? We will get into that as we discuss official use. All right, here's what we're going to discuss. Number one, we're going to talk about your responsibilities when you're using a government vehicle. We'll talk about official use and misuse. Uh, we'll talk about what's permissible and impermissible. Then we'll go over scope of employment, liability assigned. We'll discuss the Federal Tort Claims Act. And then the last part, we'll discuss privately owned vehicles on government business. And we'll also close it out with rental cars. We'll discuss specific liability and official business. Here we go. So what are some of your responsibilities? Well, you must obey all motor vehicle traffic laws of the state and local jurisdiction, except where the duties of your position require otherwise. Hmm. What's that mean? What job could I possibly have that I could be exempt from motor vehicle traffic laws? Well, somewhat to a degree. Well, like I said, I was a firefighter. Firefighters, emergency response personnel, cops, police, off, uh, police um, and, and ambulances, they, they can kind of say speed a bit, you know, go around those, those stop signs that have the white uh, border around them. Those are, uh, those are the ones that are optional and they can California stop them to where they don't have to come to a complete stop. But no matter what, if you are in a, a position where you are responding to an emergency, you still have to drive with due regard for safety. Just because you got red lights and sirens doesn't mean you can just blow through a stop sign, blow through a red light. You still have to drive with due regard for safety. Now, if you happen to be fined for an offense you commit while performing your official duty but wasn't required as part of your official duties, the payment is your personal responsibility. 
And folks, one other note, in this entire presentation, I do have references for a lot of the stuff here that, uh, that, that I'm talking about. So it's there for your use if you want to do some research afterwards. If you receive a parking or a moving violation while operating a government vehicle, you are responsible for paying the fine. You will not be reimbursed. You cannot be reimbursed. You can't use appropriated funds to pay those fines e either. That agency driver is responsible. Now, if you happen to be a fleet manager, I'm sure you've got people that are taking vehicles out on dispatch and you're signing them out and they're driving and they get them back and everything's great with them. But what about what happens four months down the road when you get a, a, uh, a video speeding ticket? Or you get, say, a violation for parking. I recommend that you have a vehicle driver log in some way, shape, or form, some way to identify who was driving that vehicle on that day. So that way you can go back and say, hey, driver X, you got the speeding ticket. Here's your picture. Here's the vehicle you're driving. You have to pay for that. Now, what happens if you don't? What happens... If there's a bunch of tickets, well, one of my, my customers called me and they said, Devin, your vehicle, my vehicle has a boot on it in the center of Pittsburgh. The vehicle had several parking tickets, and apparently the person who was driving just <laughs> got rid of them. Well, they no longer work for that agency, so the next driver, all of a sudden, he comes out and his vehicle's got a boot. Now, unfortunately, the other person, they, they don't work there. However, they do have a name. So they could go back and get that person to pay for all of those parking tickets. But there are consequences at times. Your vehicle could be booted. Some other things that you, uh, that you can do, you must pay parking fees and tolls while operating a motor vehicle owned or leased by the government. And you can expect to be reimbursed for parking and tolls and fees while performing your official duties. Expect to be reimbursed. Kind of an interesting, oh, legalish type of uh, word. Yes. So if you have two parking lots, one's free. The other one is 50 bucks a night. We would expect that you use that one that is free. But if it doesn't provide the security that you need, then by all means, use that one that costs 50 bucks a night. Because $50 a night and it's covered by or protected by a fence, that's definitely going to help you out. It would take someone to actually go and research where you went TDY to or where you're parking at to look at that stuff. So in most cases, it's not an issue when you have to pay for parking. And there's some places that only do valet parking. What, what's go, what, what happens then? Can they do it? Absolutely. If you have to valet park something, there's nothing wrong with giving the keys to that valet. They're covered under in their own insurance as soon as they take those keys and move your vehicle. Now, if you happen to receive a toll violation notice, you want to work with your respective state toll authority to pay that fee. And in most cases, appropriated funds can be used to pay the tolls. We had a situation in my office that I work at. One of my coworkers took a vehicle, and he went from Pittsburgh up to Buffalo, New York. Not bad, about a four-hour trip, give or take. And Interstate 90 in Buffalo is a toll road. We were all set. We had the transponder in the windshield. Everything was working great. And, well, it was working great up until the point that we got the toll violation notice from a collection agency about five months later. What happened was is that the transponder failed to work. We didn't know that, and it just happened to not catch it. Transponder was fine. It worked, but for whatever reason, there was an issue with uh, the, the, the sensor that picked it up. It took five months for that violation to get to us, and what ended up happening was is it went from office to office to office, got returned, and finally the, the toll authority collections folks contacted us, finally got it by mail. So what we did is we worked with that, the, the toll authority. They waived all of the fees and fines and all that because of going through that toll booth because they could see that there was a transponder there. And we were able to use our government purchase card to pay the, the toll, which is what we should have done. Use the tools that are out there. Don't be afraid to ask. No is always free. Okay, official use. I had that question early on. Difference between agency owned and GSA leased. I can't tell you what you can do with your agency owned or even GSA leased vehicles. See, official use is using a government motor vehicle to perform your agency's mission as authorized by your agency. Me working for GSA, I can't tell you if you can or cannot go to, say, oh, a strip club, a bar, 
a marijuana dispensary, but your job might actually require you to go there. Whoever makes that decision, an agency lead, they're the ones who can make that decision. And who's the agency lead? It could be a supervisor. It could be the agency head. It could be anyone in a supervisory position in your agency. They too can also make the approval for incidental use. What is incidental use? Simply put, it's using a government motor vehicle for other than official purposes. Now, wait a second, Devin, you said official. Well, how can it be other than official? In my job, I have to go to our marshaling locations, and we have one that is about a three-hour trip north of my location. So when I go, <clears throat> I can take my government vehicle at lunchtime and go to a restaurant. It's incidental use. It's inc incidental to the mission. Now, I don't have to go to a restaurant. I can pack my bag, a, a brown bag lunch or my Scooby-Doo lunchbox, and put it in there and eat on my way up. Additionally, incidental use is simply pulling off the, the highway on a rest stop to use the facilities or go to a, a gas station in case I have to use the restroom. That's allowed as well. That's incidental use. Now, think of that. If you're that person, say, uh, well, you, know, you shouldn't be taking that vehicle to a gas station if you're not getting fuel. Paint this picture in your head. You have a picture of a government vehicle at a gas station, and you have a picture of a person on the side of the road using the facilities on the side of the road where there really is no facilities, if you know what I'm talking about. I would rather have to answer for the gas station picture than the other picture. And one other thing about the incidental, incidental use, it may be a taxable benefit. And Mitchell says, where do you find inf information about the incidental use? That's based on your agency. You'll have to work with your agency fleet manager. And you might even want to contact your HR folks. They might know as well. So more things about the official use. The agency lead is the approval authority to authorize non-federal individuals to accompany you in a government vehicle, whether they're family members or candidates for the military or contractors. Can they be in that vehicle? Yes, but it needs to be authorized. Now, we talked a bit about always on offense. This is number one, always on offense. If you're going to have a non-federal person in that vehicle, make sure that it's authorized. If you don't know, ask a question. Recommend you get it in writing. We don't like selective amnesia. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about selective amnesia. Now, along with official use, be careful what you see out there because what's okay for one agency may not be okay for another. So every one of these I've been involved in here. And I've been with Fleet for quite a few years. This first one, I got a phone call from an irate individual. He called and he was quite upset because there was a GOV parked at Costco and the driver was seen buying dog food. How can a person be at, do at Costco in a government vehicle buying dog food? I got his information. I contacted the customer and the customer filled me in on the rest of the story. They weren't just buying dog food. They were buying a pallet of dog food. You see, the agency was a National Park Service, and the driver came down from Denali National Park for a meeting in Anchorage, and in the wintertime, they run a dog team. They have a dog sled team out there to get around. Got to feed them somehow. So when I called the individual back, I said, well, you didn't tell me it was a pallet of dog food. He said, I didn't think it mattered. It mattered. Sometimes there's just people with an axe to grind, and you just you know take it in stride. Another issue, we had a, a GOV parked at a pawn shop that sells guns and ammunition. Now, it wasn't just a simple GOV. It was a GSA vehicle. It was a tractor trailer, a big vehicle. So there was a routinely a, a trip that went between Anchorage and Fairbanks, and they would have to stop at certain points for mandatory rest stops. And it happened to be that this pawn shop had a parking lot big enough for that vehicle. And the owner of the shop had no, no issue with them parking there. It was authorized. They were allowed. No big deal. That part was okay. Where it shows, where, where, where things go a little bit haywire is that when the driver got out, went to the pawn shop, bought a gun, and put it in the government vehicle. That's where things got quite not okay. So things like that are up-channeled where necessary. And then this next one, I have actually personally done. I've had my GOV and I've parked it at a local grocery store while I've been on a temporary duty assignment. 
I can do that, go to a grocery store to pick up food. And then I've also been to local home and low home home improvement store, whether it's Home Depot or Lowe's, buying parts. Now I'm a retired Air Force firefighter, like I told you, and we would build props to practice on a roof, or we would we would build you know doors. And we would practice breaching the doors, cutting the roof for ventilation and things like that. See, for me, it was okay because that was part of my mission. That was part of my job. That was official. But take, for instance, say someone from the medical group. They may not have the same authority or the same latitude because why would they have to go down there? Why would they have to go to a home improvement store for things like that? Now, it could be possible. But in most cases, it most likely isn't. But... What's okay for one agency may not be okay for another. Just keep it in mind when you see some things. And if you happen to catch someone, report it to how's my driving at gsafleet.gov. That's one of the best ways. So you may not use a GOV for transportation between your residence and place of employment unless it is approved in writing by your agency head. So what this is talking about is home to work use. And when you have that, the using agency is responsible to maintain the documentation. Folks, this cannot be delegated, period. End of story, cannot be delegated. If you have home to work use, take a look at your document and see, and see who signed that. If it isn't the agency head, it's not official. And the agency head is the highest official of a federal agency. I work for GSA Fleet. Robin Carnahan, she is our highest official. If a home to work isn't signed by her for GSA, it's not valid. If you work for the Air Force, if it's not signed by the Secretary of the Air Force, it's not valid. Protect yourself. This is that covering your six, always on offense. Check. Make sure. A little bit more on the home to work. It was, uh, they must be renewed and the renewal intervals vary based on the ho uh, type of home to work authorized. In most cases, those folks that have home to work, it's two years and that's called field work. And it is updated as necessary, meaning uh, updated as far as say if there's a change in address where it's at and then 15 days for other circumstances. And the reference is how long are initial determinations effective. And uh, so references there, you can check it out if you need. So what about an emergency? When COVID happened, this became quite a hot topic. Can an employee drive a government motor vehicle home? Sure, they can, absolutely, but only if the head of the agency is authorized at home to work transportation. Always on offense. It must be in writing. And that initial determination cannot be effective for more than 15 days. Get it in writing. Make sure you have it covered, yourself covered beforehand. Because if not, I mean, what happens? Hopefully nothing. But if something bad does end up happening, you, you want to make sure that, that you have all of your ducks in a row so that you're taken care of. And you want to make sure that all that paperwork is done beforehand. Beforehand, Consult your agency fleet manager for specific agency guidance. Now, one of the most recent changes for the home to work, it was rewritten to clarify the employees using vehicles in conjunction with official travel from coverage by the regulation. So if you're on official travel, it's no longer covered by the home to work. It's not meant to give blanket authority to take a government vehicle home prior to a TDY. It does allow taking a government vehicle home if the use is more advantageous to the government. So let me break this down for you, make it a little bit easier. So I work in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I live in a little town called Carlisle. That's about, oh, about 40 minutes away, not too bad. If I'm going on travel and I'm going west instead of east, I can actually take my government vehicle home the night before and start my trip out from my home because it's more advantageous to the government. I'm saving almost two hours. I don't have to drive into the office, pick up the vehicle, only to drive back past my house. GSA, I can use a vehicle between official station and TDY locations, including driving the vehicle to the residence the night before if doing so is in the interest of efficiency. Yes, it absolutely, it, it is more efficient. But if you're, wanna, if you, if you're gonna do that, make sure you follow your agency's guidance on official travel. Make sure you have written approval before you take that GOV home. This is where that selective amnesia comes into play. We don't want anyone to have that. If you get in in writing, someone can't say, oh, I forgot, or oh, I didn't say that. I didn't know. Protect yourself. 
And whatever approval you have, make sure it's on your official travel order, whether it's DTS, soon to become my travel in fiscal year 2025, Concur, E2, or whatever agency specific you have for authorizing TDY travel. Now, what is not covered? This does not count for day trips. If you're going on travel and it's just for the day and you're not on orders, this does not count. This is only for official travel. And the second change from the home to work, it was updated saying that the employee's use of vehicles between work and mass transit facilities is no longer covered because now there's a new regulation that covers that. 41 CFR 102-34-210. Yes, more government numbers and paperwork and everything else. It's all good though. Because the head of the agency must make that determination in, in writing and is valid for a year. There's no safe and reliable commercial or duplicative federal mass transportation services that serves the same route. This transportation needs to be made available to other federal employees. And of course, to protect the environment, use AFVs. This is kind of hard, though. This is kind of difficult to justify. Because when you say no safe and reliable commercial or duplicative federal mass transportation service, we've got Uber, we've got Lyft, we've got taxis. There's other options out there. Now, truly, I've talked to some folks who have seen this and we've discussed it. They truly have no option because they are out very remote. And for them, it makes more sense to use that GOV to the airport, train station, or whatever it may be. All right. Now we know it's official. Let's talk about what's permissible. What can you use that, that GOV for? You can make rounds of area work sites. You can att attend official meetings. You can attend official training, go on official errands, post office, court, car maintenance, car washes, and your TDY station to your hotel. There's one word ringing true. That's official, official, official. Official. Do the official thing. And here's some things that you can do while you're on a temporary duty assignment, a TDY. You can go to the drug or grocery store, barbershop, attend worship services, eating at restaurants, visiting a laundromat or dry cleaner, and similar places necessary for the sustenance, comfort, or health of the employee. What does that mean? Well, it could be hard to define. What if the gym at the hotel isn't good enough for you? You want to go to Planet Fitness? I would see that, that I, I could say that, that could cover under or fall under the uh, sustenance, comfort, healthy employee. What about those extended TDYs? Things like this are going to be agency specific. Ask the question before you use that vehicle. Some things that you shouldn't do with a government vehicle, going to a private social function, a birthday, retirement party, bar, or strip club, and transporting people not authorized to be in that GOV. If you don't have the authorization for them to be in there, they may not be covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Things get pretty hairy after that happens. And folks, I'm telling you now, don't do personal errands in a government vehicle. And, and if you're in a position of leadership, please do not send your subordinates to do personal errands. We're going to get into this, and I've said this each class that I've taught this, this month. This really irritates me. You'll hear it in my voice. And when you see how egregious this is, you'll understand where this is coming from. All right? So more things that you shouldn't do, engage in entertainment activities while on TDY, mall or the movie. Okay? Your GOV is for official business. Don't attend local sporting events or attractions unless you're authorized to do it. We have one agency out there that I know of that can. Veterans Administration, the VA. They take, uh, they take our, our vets to sporting events, football games, baseball games. They take them, you know, places that they go for recreation, for healing. You ideally should not pick up hitchhikers. But what if you live in a cold weather state? I used to live in Alaska. 50 degrees below zero ambient temperature. If there's someone on the side of the road, I may not have had a legal requirement to stop and help them, but I sure had a moral one to stop. I recommend that you have a policy on how to address the emergency situations. Take a look and see if you already have one. For GSA, this is specific to GSA only for when we're driving, okay? It is official business when a GOV is used to render assistance in major disasters or emergency situations. So if I'm giving help to someone, got into an accident, you know, I can help and I can use my GOV to do that and I'm covered. That's the right thing to do. Ask the question. 
find out. Some more examples of things that you really ideally should not do, carrying medical marijuana in a GOV for a patient. Currently, any use of marijuana is not legal under federal law. Even though it's legal in some states, it's still illegal according to the federal government. I do expect this to change eventually, but as it is right now, you shouldn't do it. And carrying a personally owned firearm in a GOV, uh, generally speaking, you cannot carry a privately owned firearm in a GOV unless you're performing a law enforcement mission. Some agencies provide a weapon, others don't. If they let you take your PO, or, I'm sorry, your, your privately owned gun, weapon, firearm, by all means, take care of it. Do that. You can. It's authorized. But for those that don't have a law enforcement mission, work with your agency fleet manager, general counsel for specific information. This is one thing that I have absolutely no case law. I've got no examples of where a person can or cannot other than if they are on a police uh, mission or police job. The penalty for misuse of a government vehicle. All right. If an empo employee willfully uses or authorizes the use of a GOV for other than official purposes, more to come on this, the employee is subject to suspension of at least one month or up to including removal by the head of the agency. There's consequences. That's why we want to do things the right way. All right. Titled What If. I've been teaching this class for quite a while and early on. My friend, John DeWolf, uh, we worked this together, and we got these questions in email afterwards. And interesting questions, more interesting replies. But Devin, you said you cannot use a GOV to en engage in entertainment activities while on TDY, like the Mahler movie. Yes, I did say that. Well, this person was thinking, what if I go to the restaurant that's in the mall? Can I eat there, then go see a movie? No. You draw the line when you use it for that unofficial purposes, that unofficial purpose, the movie. What if I park on the other side of the street? Can I go to the mall or sh to shop or watch a movie? That was a follow-up to that first question. No, don't game the system. Don't get yourself in trouble. Always on offense. You're going to be on defense if you don't. And this was the most scary, absolutely legitimate. This was a series of questions back and forth and answers. What if I drink alcohol during dinner? Can I drive a GOV as long as my blood alcohol content is below the legal limit? Really? Yeah, really. Perception's reality. You're the target for scrutiny when driving a government vehicle, and people are looking for you to do something wrong. They will report you. Don't ever drink alcohol and drive, and please, 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 please be prepared to justify your actions. Don't risk it, okay? I'll help you understand that part. Be prepared to justify your actions real soon with a picture. So I want you to think as I go through this scenario, permissible or impermissible, what do you think? This is an incident that was reported to How's My Driving at GSA.gov, and it starts out to whom it may concern. On 22 October 2021, I'm going to stop there. Based on that address, if there's any military out there, whoever reported this was military in some way, shape, or form, that's how we just do our dates. At 8.45 a.m., Vehicle, it's a G-Tag, so it was a GSA vehicle, was seen at the Fine Wine and Good Spirits store. Fine Wine and Good Spirits is a Pennsylvania-based liquor store. The soldier got out of the vehicle, stood in line, and purchased at least one bottle of a Midwinter's Night's Dram Rye Whiskey. Additionally, it appears a soldier was there with his supervisor. The supervisor was in civilian clothes, talking to other customers, saying something to the effect of, and bragging, sending him down to Kentucky on orders when the PX gets a specific whiskey, the PX is a post exchange. Are you kidding me? This guy's bragging about blatant unofficial use. See, there's a difference between ignorance and stupid. This is stupid. The individual there is in, in uniform and had his name out everywhere. Pictures were, were sent with this, and so it was it, – obviously, it was just it, – it's so – it just blows my mind. This supervisor is engaging in illegal, simply illegal activity. And if you think I'm seriously kidding about the pictures, yep, there's a government vehicle parked right in front. Didn't care. This was up-channeled. And it was handled in a loud, grotesque military manner, I'm sure. So it was taken care of. Okay, here's the next one. 
This is verbatim, another one on how's my driving at gsa.gov. They titled it official use and a possible DUI. And I quote, call me crazy, but two government vehicles and their drivers are at a bar drinking is a bad thing. Sure. July 8th, 2023, 2,800 hours or longer, Chevy Equinox with guard markings, a Chrysler van with guard markings. I've attached pictures of the two vehicles with plates and showing the bar sign. Wow. Remember I said, be prepared to justify your actions. Don't risk it. This very well could be legitimate. Okay. I did a little bit of searching from overhead via Google Maps, and it's a fairly remote area. You look at the sunset. It's about dinner time. These folks could have been out recruiting incidental use, went to go eat something. This could very well be legitimate. But remember, perception's reality. This may not be authorized. It very well could be authorized. Be prepared to justify your actions. Don't risk it. Okay, so what happens if there's an accident? Something happened, there's an accident. Well, an investigation has started, and the information that they're going to find out. Was a government employee negligent? Were they obeying laws? Were they speeding under the influence of drugs or alcohol, talking, texting, texting, or on their cell phone? Were they within the scope of their employment? What does scope of employment mean? Well, it's a legal term. It's an activity authorized by a competent authority, whether it's a supervisor, standard operating procedure, policy, orders, a law, and was serving at least part a government purpose. It's determined by state law where the accident occurs. This is a critical component. You'll see why in a few. And under circumstances where the U.S., if a private person would be liable to claim it under state law, basically this is the legal way of saying, if you have a person who does a similar mission, say like a parts runner for a store, if they were in an accident, how, how would it be covered? Things that they're going to look at during this investigation, and this can be very uncomfortable because they are going to be very thorough, very thorough at the time, place, and occasion of the accident. Was it during normal business hours? What's normal? If you're in the military, it's 24-7. For me, my, my work hours, 7 to, 7 to 3.30. What happens to me if I get into an accident outside of those hours? They're going to look. Why are you here before your normal work time? Why are you here after? Why are you driving that government vehicle? Was it an act commonly done by such an employee? Do others in the office perform a similar function? They're going to look at the extent of departure from normal methods of performance. Basically, how far out of line did they go? And was it an act the employer reasonably could have anticipated? Was it motivated to serve the employer? Was it personal? Within the general authority and further, in furtherance of the employer's business and for the accomplishment of the objective which employed. It's thorough. It's in-depth. I've had folks who have attended the class. They've called me and said, Devin, I am on year four of depositions, and we still have not figured out if this employee was under the scope of employment. Extremely thorough. On the good side, it's a back and forth with the Justice Department, and the Justice Department makes the final decision. Some examples of out of scope of employment, commuting to and from work, depending on state laws. This would be for, say, home to work. Um, Intoxicated or willful negligence, generally not in scope. And with generally being underlined, I'm sure there's more to that. A little bit of foreshadowing. Using a vehicle without permission, also known as stolen. Deviating from the route, generally not in scope. Now, a, a clarification on deviating from the route. Deviating from the route is not a detour. So if you are going from point A to point B and you are detoured onto a different road, a different highway, or somewhere slightly out of your way because of construction, a vehicle accident, that's not deviating from your route. Deviating from your route is you're expected to go from point A to point B and you take a side trip. You go 40, 50 miles out of your way to go to a certain store to do some shopping, go see a family member. That's deviating from the route. Okay, And then the accident occurred when not doing something to promote the mission of the agency is generally not in scope. Now, folks, I do have some accident pictures coming up in the next few slides. Uh, like I told you, I'm a, I'm a volunteer firefighter, and uh, th they're not bad pictures. There, there is a slightly naked picture. I just want to forewarn you. And here we go. So that poor tree got hit, and it looks like its pants were taken off. So 
That's the extent of naked pictures. All right, scope of employment case study. This is Essig v. the United States of America. This is from 1987. Here's, here's a synopsis of the case. An undercover DEA agent who operated as a drug trafficker was routinely, he routinely used his assigned GOB in coordination with his duties. On 6 August 1984, Mr. Hammer reported to work, filled out expense forms, and set up a meeting with an informant at a local bar for later in the evening. <clears throat> he also tried to contact another agent to assist with the meeting he was arranging with the informant. At approximately 4.30, he left his office and went to a bar in the same building. It was down in the basement. He consumed a number of alcoholic beverages before heading back to the office at 7.15. At approximately 9 p.m., Hamill, while driving his GOV, hit a bicyclist on the shoulder of the road. He did not stop, render aid, and continued home. He awoke the next morning to find the windshield of his vehicle was broken. Now, it wasn't only just broken. There was a body print in that window. He paid $200 of his personal funds to pay to repair the windshield. What do you think? You don't have to put anything in the Q&A, but what do you think based on that? Is he within the scope of his employment or is the U.S. government liable? Very thorough investigation, very thorough. And you'll be surprised to find out that the court ruled the agent was not merely going to his home to engage in his own business, but was acting in the furtherance of his employer's business by going home with the understanding he re would receive a call from a fellow agent who would accompany him on the meeting. And the history of the relationship between the Hamill and, G and the DEA is consistent with the finding that Hamill was acting within the scope of his employment at the time of the accident. This guy is lucky. Okay. Now, what happens, and, and we'll go over really what ends up happening about scope of employment, how the federal government gets involved, but, ooh, very lucky, because as far as a third party goes, he's not going to be responsible. The federal government is. But just because he was acting within the scope of his employment didn't mean he was free and clear. He was arrested and charged with leaving the scene of an accident, reckless endangerment, and he pled guilty to those charges. I do not know if there was any uh, jail time or whatnot. Do not know. All right, here's another one. This is Singleton versus Birchfield from February 25th, 2005. And this shows the impact a state ruling has on the case. Here's what happened. We had an Air Force, United States Air Force active duty airman was on a temporary duty assignment to Maxwell Air Force Base for Airman Leadership School. He was issued a government vehicle to use at the TDY location. He was involved in an accident en route to a study session at Tony Roma's. Hmm. There might be the first kind of red flag. Why wasn't he eaten at the base? So in this case, it says, you know, the individual got done with school, worked out, and then went back to his dorm, took a shower, and then got in his vehicle and went to Tony Roma's. And for those of you that are military, on his orders, it said meals were not available or directed, meaning he wasn't allowed to eat at the dining facility. And then additionally, he was allowed to take this vehicle off base. Hi, folks. You did not time out. Uh, it looks like uh, Devin's on mute temporarily. Sorry, guys. I was having a coughing fit. I apologize for that. So I'll get back to what we're just talking about. Thank you, Joseph. All right. So he was allowed to take his vehicle downtown. And uh, he was going to Tony Roma's, getting ready to take a legal left-hand turn. There was a, uh, he pulls out into the intersection, the light turns yellow, a truck coming at him stopped because the light turned yellow. The vehicle behind that truck sped up. You know, red means stop, green means go, and yellow means go faster. So they come around that vehicle and he T-bones the government vehicle. Kind of bad. So the way it was written, According to the Air Force instruction, the motor vehicle should be operated as follows between places of business, lodging and eating establishments, drug stores, barbershops, and places of worship. Here's the kicker. Under Alabama law, the use of a vehicle owned by an employer creates an administrative presumption that the employee was acting within the scope of his employment. The mere fact that this airman was driving that vehicle, according to Alabama law, he's within the scope of his employment. He was covered. It was good. The government stepped in for him.
he the government stepped in and, and, and basically took that liability for him. And a little bit more about that case it was about uninsured motorist and the government vehicle not having quote unquote true insurance. It's all done. It's all taken care of. And as far as the government goes, the young airman was taken was covered. So liability, what does that term mean? Simply put, it means you're responsible. How is it going to impact you if you're found at fault? Good question. You're going to have to pay for the damage? Maybe. We'll see. We'll take a look. So basically, if you were driving a GOV and faulted for causing an accident, injury, or damage and were under your scope of employment or within the scope of your employment, you're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. This applies to those third-party claims, i.e. the other vehicle. If you were not acting in your scope of employment and caused an accident, injury, or damage while using a GOV, you're personally liable. You are going to need a good lawyer, a good lawyer. What the Federal Tort Claims Act does, it allows individuals to recover against the federal government for any injury, wrongful death, property damage, and so on, caused by negligence of a federal employee acting within their scope of employment. And the only type of relief allowed under the Federal Tort Claims Act is money damages for a specified amount. Now, in this case, it's not necessarily all about the money, but it is. So say, for instance, I'm hit by a government vehicle. I've got a 2000 Ford F-250 with a 7.3 liter diesel. It's easier for the government to pay me for that vehicle versus try and find another 2000 Ford F-250 7.3 liter diesel. So that's why they just do it for a, a money damage amount. And the Federal, Employee, in Federal Employees Liability Reform and Tort Compensation Act of 1988, it amended the Federal Tort Claims Act to make it the exclusive remedy. Everything is done and taken care of by the Federal Tort Claims Act. So generally speaking, you are protected from being personally sued by a third party as long as you're acting in your scope of employment. Now, with any good rule, there's always an exception. And it says that the Federal Tort Claims Act does not apply to claims arising out of these assault, to name a few, assault, false imprisonment, abuse of process, libel, slander, misrepresentation, and so on, unless the, it, the, the claim is, it comes from an investigative or law enforcement officer of the United States, and the six are assault, battery, false imprisonment, false arrest, and malicious prosecution. The Federal Tort Claims Act would step in in that case. So basically speaking, the Federal Tort Claims Act is the federal government's insurance policy. Essentially, it substitutes the federal government for the individual as a defendant. Now, the using and owning agency pays the third-party claim if the driver is at fault and working within their scope of employment. So if it's a GSA fleet leased vehicle, <clears throat> the, the, the agency that leases that from GSA would be responsible for that payment. So if you're involved in a vehicle accident, you're at fault and within your scope of employment, work with your agency's legal office. They're the POC agency for legal claims against the government. And it's the Air Force, uh, an example, if it's any branch of the military, it's the JAG, the Judge Advocate General. And if you're a different federal agency, it's your general counsel, your legal office. We all have one. All right. So what about contractors? Good questions. What about contractors? How are they covered while driving a GSA, GOV, or an agency-provided government vehicle? Well, it depends on how that contract is written. If it's a cost reimbursable, meaning they le lease directly from GSA, they have to abide by FAR 51.2. It is the sole responsibility of that contracting officer to ensure the requirements are met. So if you're involved with that in any way, shape, or form, make sure that contracting officer is doing the right thing. And FAR 51-202 requires contractors leasing directly from GSA to provide proof of vehicle liability insurance. And my good friend Stacy, she provided me this other reference, FAR 28.307-2, for liability insurance requirements. It lays out what they should have. It's a very good document. I would make sure that if you are involved in this in any way, shape, or form, get these two references, read through them, and make sure that they are, are adequately represented in that contract. Now, in most cases, it's a federal agency providing leased or owned vehicles to a contractor in the performance of a contract. That federal agency is responsible to ensure the contract clauses are in place to protect government interests. Once again, refer to that FAR 28.307-2 for information on the insurance requirements. And a question that we routinely get, are government contractors allowed to, allowed to ride in a GOV? Yeah, absolutely. Reference slide 12, as long as it's authorized. Sure can. All right. Anyone here driving in Canada or Mexico? 
Many foreign countries, including Canada, do not recognize the U.S. government self-insurance. Ooh, look out. If driving a GOV in Canada or Mexico and your agency is not covered by a SOFA, a stat status of forces agreement, or other diplomatic treaty which specifically addresses liability issues, GSA's general counsel's office determined that an agency must purchase additional liability insurance to operate vehicles in foreign countries. Unless your mission is covered by that diplomatic treaty or SOFA, most civilian agencies are not covered by that treaty or status of forces agreement. If you need information on that, let me know. I've got some resources from other folks who have attended this class, and I can pass them on to you. See, the Federal Tort Claims Act does not protect federal employees outside the United States, and you want to contact your agency's general counsel office for assistance. And if you have a short duration trip, consider commercial rentals that are inclusive of insurance in foreign countries. All right. So what about damage to that government vehicle? We've covered that if you're responsible for an accident and there's a third party claim, the government's going to step in for you. But what about you driving that government vehicle? Here's a pretense. The government employees at fault. There's damage to the GOV. The Federal Tort Claims Act protects them from third party liability. Can you, the driver, be held liable for damages to the government vehicle? What do you think? Well, yes, absolutely you can. You can be held liable. However, there's a process, okay? Federal Tort Claims Act covers third-party claims. It does not cover damage to the agency or owned, uh, agency owned or leased GSA vehicle. This guidance is based on the Department of Justice ruling for the EPA, and it's referenced there. But typically, the policy is going to vary by each agency, but a border survey has to be convened. Basically, they are an official investigative and vetting process. They have to prove some type of negligence. They can't just arbitrarily say, oh, hey, you were in an accident. You got to pay this amount of money. No, you have to investigate. You got to find some type of negligence. And that invest investigation will decide if the at-fault driver has to pay for damages to the GOV. And some examples are an Army FLIPL, an Air Force reporter survey. That's the investigation. Okay. They're called accidents, not on purposes. I mean, there are some times where people do on purpose wreck a government vehicle, but most of the time they're accidents. So that's where this is. This is here to protect you. It's here to protect the drivers. Okay, privately owned vehicles on government business. Privately owned vehicles on government business. In most cases, the use of POVs for the benefit of the government is prohibited unless officially authorized. And when authorized, the employee is reimbursed on a mileage basis. The cost of collision liability insurance is a component of that mileage reimbursement. A couple things to watch out for. We'll get into those. If you're involved in an accident in your POV, you were at fault and had proper authorization to use your POV for government business, you cannot be held liable for damage or injuries to third parties if acting within your scope of employment. You're covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Now. This doesn't indemnify you from discipline or adverse actions for negligence, but you're covered on that third party. Now, you being the employee, you've got to seek reimbursement from your private insurance carrier for loss or damage to your vehicle while under POV travel authorization. You get paid the mileage rate. If you're using your, your vehicle for, for government work, voucher for your miles. And I strongly recommend, strongly recommend, contact your insurance company to find out if and how you're covered when you use your POV for government business. Research what type of additional coverage you might need. Protect yourself, protect your vehicle. So for me, I have State Farm and I contacted my State Farm agent and I said, hey, I said, I want to use my, my POV for government business. What do I have to do? I could get a rider on my policy that would protect me. And my insurance agent wasn't really concerned about the vehicle per se, the first question and only question they ask, how many people are you bringing? That's where that line was drawn for State Farm. The other thing that I could do as far as protecting myself while driving a government vehicle, I could get a rider that said that that is a for quote under other owned vehicles. So there's options out there. But ask the question. And the reason I say, I've had about one lady, she worked for the Federal Trade Commission, and she contacted me. She said, Devin, she says, here's what I find out. I contacted my insurance company, who happened to be Amica, 
and explain to them what I was doing. And they told her, we won't cover you when you're using your vehicle for official government business. Now, this lady happened to buy fireworks in mass. What they would do is when there was a problem with a certain type of firework, they would go around all over their area and buy all of them, fire them off and see if there was something that would, you know, generate a do not use recall or whatnot. So she had, you know, thousands of fireworks in the back of her vehicle. If her car caught on fire because of the fireworks, Amika wasn't going to cover. When she asked her supervisor, his comment was, well, I just, I thought you would be covered. Always on offense, folks, because in that case, you sure don't want to be on defense. One other thing about privately owned vehicles, if you're driving in Canada or Mexico, contact your insurance company and make sure you got the right coverage if you're going to be visiting Canada or Mexico. Protect yourself. All right. Employees may file a claim under the Military Personnel and Civilian Employees Claims Act for the deductible amount of the employee's personal insurance policy. You want to work through your agency's general counsel to submit and process that claim. You can file a claim. There's no guarantee that it's going to be, be you know, covered or paid, but it's an option that's out there. The key to using a POV for official government business is authorized. An employee cannot arbitrarily use their vehicle without proper authorization to perform government business and expect you to be, and expect to be covered. Additionally, no one can force you to use your POV to do official government business. They can't force you. If you are driving, voucher for your miles. All right, here's the most recent newly updated information. This is as of 2023. All right, this is for rental cars. Generally, drivers are covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act. That scope of employment and official use rules apply. When you rent a vehicle, get the vehicle with the government rate because it provides a myriad of protections to the drivers. For more information, take a look at uh, Defense Travel and read rental agreement number four. It's a fantastic document. There's so much in there. But here's just an excerpt. This is kind of interesting. It says the company and not the renter or the U.S. government hereby assumes and shall bear the entire risk of loss or damage to the rented vehicles, including cost of towing, administrative costs, loss of use and replacements from any and every cause whatsoever, included but not limited to casualty, collision, fire, flood, upset, malicious mischief, vandalism, tire damage, and so on. Okay, except where the loss or damage is caused by one or more of the following. And there's a list of things that will show where it's not covered. Basically, if you're doing bad things with that rental car, rental agreement number four and that GARS fee, that $5 per day, will not cover it. Take a look at rental agreement number four, some really, really good information. We encourage you to use the companies that offer that government rate because of the protections that they provide. So what about after hours? Can I use that same rental car for personal use? What do you think? It's been updated. All right. 41 CFR 301-10.450 was updated on April 22nd, 2022, and it added paragraph F. And paragraph F clarifies how the government rental vehicle must be used. It is, quote, for official purposes. There is no mention of personal use at all. A rental car is to be used for official purposes, which include transportation between places of official business, between such places of temporary lodging when public transportation is unavailable or its use is impractical, and between either subparagraph one or two of this paragraph and drugstores, barbershops, places of worship, and so on. Folks, there's no more personal use with rental cars. Now, we're not saying that you can't go out and do fun stuff. Mall, movies, sporting events. It's just that you shouldn't use that rental vehicle to get there. You can use that vehicle to go to a barbershop, to go to eat, get something to eat, to go to um, um, you know, Walmart, pick up clothes or any, any other target, whatever you happen to, to like. It's just the personal use, personal use, driving 50 miles to go visit a friend from high school on a weekend, driving to a sporting event. That's personal use, driving to see family members. That's personal use. So one thing to keep in mind, all right, vehicles rented under the short-term rental program do not have the same protections found in rental agreement number four. They're two separate programs. The short-term rental, 
They're handled very similar to GSA fleet leased vehicles. The liability is covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act and damage to the rented vehicle is submitted to the short-term rental program office as a claim. And the STR program will issue payment for valid claims. And then those costs are passed through to the agency via the short-term rental statement, which are the J and the K bills now. So what do you think? We're at the end. The ultimate question of the session, are you personally liable if you're involved in a vehicle accident while driving a government vehicle and are at fault? And the answer is most definitely maybe. It depends on the mitigating circumstances included but not limited to the official use, scope of employment, the state the accident was in, and fault. Contact your agency fleet manager or general counsel for more information. Here's what we went over. We talked about your responsibilities. We talked about official use and misuse, permissible and impermissible use, scope of employment, liability assigned, the Federal Tort Claims Act. We talked about privately owned vehicles on government business, and we discussed rental cars, and we answered the liability question. So folks, like I mentioned before, I want to say thank you very much for attending today's workshop. If you have a, uh, need additional information or have a question that might, be, that you might seem very, very involved, my email is right there, devin.beckus at gsa.gov. Send me an email. I do get back to everyone. It just might take me a little while. Uh, and just so everyone knows, today you are in a class with over 1,000 attendees. That doesn't count all the folks that signed into one computer. So thank you for taking this class. Uh, it's the last one that we're teaching for this year, and we will have it loaded on YouTube. So it's always available, always available for you to take a look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, start taking questions. We've got 12 of them so far in the Q&A box. So if you have a question, go ahead and load them up in there. And Justin says, recent guidance about GOV indicated that non-government passengers would not be covered by the government insurance policy, even if they are approved to, to ride the vehicle. There was a fair bit of confusion over that. Is that the case? Justin, I don't know. Can't answer that. I've got no case law to even give you any guidance. What I would do in that case, talk with your agency general counsel. Someone needs to come up with an answer for that to find out because that's a really good question. Ryan says, what if you have to drive a GSA or agency-owned vehicle into Canada since we are self-insured and if you got in a wreck or pulled over, is the vehicle still covered? Well, no, we already discussed that. Okay, not covered in most cases. So recommend a rental car or um, you know, the additional insurance. That's what I would recommend. And if you need a reference, shoot me an email. We'll get you there. All right. Neverly says, fellow Alaskan here. We struggle with needing bear spray for field work and not being able to have it in a GOV. Any tips? Um, so Neverly, I will tell you, GSA does not limit what you can or cannot do. So I would recommend, here's a couple of thoughts. Work with your local agency fleet manager, ask the question. Work with HR. This could be a safety issue. I've, I've had bears, grizzly bears. I've had you know, brown bears, you know, gri grizzly, not brown bears, uh, come at me while I've been down on the Russian River fishing. And it stinks. It's scary. It's, you know, you don't know if you, you, just, you don't know what's going to happen. You can't have a gun unless you're, you know, fishing wildlife or anything like that. But bear spray is by far more, uh, more effective. Maybe if you're presented as a safety issue, maybe that will help you. All right. Chad says, our agency, uh, the FAA and DOT, allows transportation of a personally owned firearm and approved lock case for our technicians to go on remote sites in our Alaska, di Alaska district for wildlife protection. So there is the first notice for a non-police that I have heard. So the FAA has authorized it, but there's stipulations. Got to be in a lock case. They can have it but there's rules behind it. So check out your agency. And Chad, thank you very much for that information. That's good to know. Uh, was not aware of that. So thank you. Um, find out what your agency says and do what's right. All right. Joel says, I am a tribal forestry technician who uses a GSA rig for my work. Forestry is part of the tribal natural resources department. Who is my agency lead to get permission from? Is it my boss, forest manager? Is it natural resources director? Joel, are you talking about home to work? And if you are, send me an email. We're going to have to find out who that is. Um, got a lot of questions in there, so I won't be able to see your reply. 
Uh, so yeah, they, we'll get you in the right direction to find out who that person is, okay? All right, Ann says, if we are injured in an accident while in a GOV, is there any medical coverage workers comp through the federal government or would we use our personal medical coverage for treatment? Uh, Ann, uh, I'm speaking out of turn here, work with HR, ask them this question, but I do believe workman's compensation would step in and cover that because you're injured at work. Additionally, if it's the other person's fault, their insurance will also cover and, and step in there. How it happens, cannot answer that. I don't know that part, but that is where I would, I would start. Donna says, if there is no government vehicle available and you must use your POV, then have an accident, will the government cover it? Cover it? So Donna, a couple things about the POV use. Is it authorized for you to use your POV? Do you want to use your POV? If you don't, they can't force you. Uh, if you have an accident and you're um, um, authorized, they'll step in for the third party, but you're responsible to fix your own vehicle. That's why I say make sure that you ask your insurance company if you're covered and how. That's what that uh, mileage rate is for, is to cover those additional insurance costs you might have. And then also don't forget, you could also uh, file a claim for the deductible part. <clears throat> oh, Stacy. Stacy says, new rental agreement effective April 1st, 2024. Okay. <clears throat> I have not seen the new one yet. I have not seen um, what it says. So, Stacy's saying that rental agreement no longer has guards. So, I'm going to have to get in there and look. So, as of Monday, before Monday, everything I'm telling you is correct. So, I'll get in there and I'll research that. And Stacy, thank you very much for the information. That is a good to know. I'll have to find out how it works or what's going on now. Uh, Amy says, do I have a DOD specific example of authorization document? Uh, are we all supposed to have a copy of our authorizations on us at all times when operating a GOV? Um, Amy, I do not. Um, I don't know what that would look like, especially for the DOD. When I was in the Air Force, I had a a government driver's license and it said what vehicles I was authorized to drive. You know, for, as far as that goes, that was it. Edward says, in the travel authorization system, it makes you choose a GOV was available and enter. It makes you choose if a GOV was available and entering a POV. Why, while this does clearly change to mileage, does it make it legal difference on your protections and or coverage? Um, hmm. Does it make a legal difference on your protections and coverage? Specifically on that question, Edward, I can't answer for sure because I think it would depend on your insurance company. When you choose if a, PU, a GOV was available, it changes your reimbursement rate. So you're going to get the reduced reimbursement rate for mileage. Um, so that's the one change that I'm aware of. As far as being protected under the Federal Tort Claims Act, as long as it's in your orders, you're still covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act as long as you're within your scope of employment. So the other part about the difference on protections and coverage, um, if I didn't answer your question there, Shoot me an email, and then we can discuss later. All right. Laura says, what about couples that were married before being hired by the agency and that work at the same office and conduct the same official duties? Would it be permissible for the couple to drive in the same vehicle together to and from work? Can they ride in the same vehicle to get lunch? Laura, I'm assuming, and you know what happens when you assume, that you're talking about home to work. If that's the case, based on what the way I understand it, I would say no without authorization. So trust but verify, and I would work with human resources and or the agency fleet manager to find out. This is the first time I've ever been asked to ask a question like this, so I thank you for that. And uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind, Send me an email on what you find out. I would really appreciate it. Cindy says, if you have approval to use your POV and you have it on your concur voucher and it's approved, is that enough information to prove it was approved or do you need a different form of approval? Cindy, thank you for the tongue twister. That was good. If you are approved on your, on your orders on concur, it's proved. Done. What I would also follow up with is 
check to see how you're covered with your insurance, okay? James says, we are currently conducting a flipple regarding a vehicle that was totaled because the gentleman is driving to a work destination, fell asleep and crashed into another driver. Our organization determined he was at fault and is being required to pay for the damage of the GOV. Should he contest that because he was driving in the scope of his duties? I would. I absolutely would. And the other thing that I would recommend, James, in this case, was it looked at? Was this stuff looked at? What are his work hours? How much has this individual been working? Was it reasonable? Should he have had more sleep time? You know, if you found negligence in that, it's okay to challenge it because if you don't ask, you're not going to know. Um, scope of employment here would cover for the third party, but as far as as long as there was a, you know, is, the flip was done. And they found some type of negligence because he fell asleep. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend, look at past flipples and what is the, what's the standard? What has been set? Because if there was any other flipple out there where a person who fell asleep didn't have to pay for the GOV, it's going to be kind of hard to make this guy pay for it as well, too. So, you know, he can contest. He's not going to know if he doesn't contest and, and no is free. David says, how do you explain to a police officer that you do not have proof of an insurance card for the GOV you're driving? Um, David, you should always have a proof of insurance for the vehicle that you're driving. So if it's a GSA leased vehicle on the back of our accident kit, there is a statement that says proof of insurance. This serves as a proof of, ins a proof of insurance for this government vehicle. If it's an agency owned, if it's an agency owned, then there is a statement along the same lines as well. So work with your fleet manager, whoever that may be, and find out what they can provide to you. Mary says, what exactly is with the change with GARS on the contracts for rentals? I don't know, Mary. I don't know what it says yet. I have not seen the new document. So I'm being told that there's one new as of 1 April, and I'm going to take a look, and I'm going to get in there, and I'm going I'm to digest it and find out what's going on with it. And then we'll update it as necessary in the, in the presentation. Thank you. Tim says, is verbal approval okay for POV use or should email or form nine always be used? Tim, I would never go by verbal approval. We don't want selective amnesia. I didn't tell you you could do that. I did not tell you you could do that. That's easy to say, but they can't say, I didn't send that email. Come from your account. Protect yourself, Tim, always on offense. You don't want to be on defense in this case. All right. Kevin says, we always have to have vehicle non-availability. Non <laughs> we always have to have a vehicle non-availability letter to get POV authorization and mileage reimbursed from the budget officer. So it sounds like there, Kevin, that your agency has steps in place to allow the POV authorization. So you've got documentation. That's good. The other thing that I would recommend for everyone and tell your folks, talk to your insurance company, ask that question, find out, am I covered? Okay, thanks. Okay, so Tim is saying GARS is no more. GARS is no more. I'll get in there. I will, I'm gonna get with our travel folks as well too. And um, I'm, I'm gonna find that out. This is, and this is the part that I absolutely love about this. I love the feedback because sometimes I won't find out. So thank you to everyone who's telling me about the GARS stuff. I appreciate it. Fantastic. All right, Claudia says, so GOVs are not personal vehicles and should not be used as such. Absolutely. So tribal policy and sovereignty do not apply to any G-plate vehicles. Um, Claudia, cannot answer definitively. Okay. It's a government vehicle, should be used for official use should be used for official use. Wanda says, could we set up a camera in GSA to cover drivers in case of accident is not their fault? As far as putting cameras in a vehicle? Yeah, you can. You can. Um, 
The other thing too that actually is helpful is the GeoTab. Uh, GeoTab records accidents, and it can record you know both. It can record your vehicle, what's going on with your vehicle, and where the vehicle's hitting. To give you an example, uh, uh, when we did our GeoTab stuff, we had an individual who uh, the, the other vehicle, the other folks said that they hit them. When in fact the geotab was recording the vehicle going zero miles per hour, they were able to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that that vehicle was not moving and that it was the other vehicle's fault. All right, Kevin says if I volunteer to use a POV versus using a GSA for convenience, budget officer can offer reduced mileage rate. Uh, actually, I believe that is correct, Kevin. If a GOV is available and not used, you will get the reduced rate. All right, Steve says, if I choose to rent a vehicle personally because I want to transport my spouse on official travel, how would liability work? Would I be allowed to claim mileage on my travel authorization? Steve, great question for your travel folks, most likely HR as well too, and uh, probably in, uh, general counsel. I've got no case law to go on. I've had other people have asked a, that similar question about family members. Um, I, I don't have case law. I don't have any examples to give you on how that would work with uh, uh, any type of liability with your spouse. And then as far as being able to claim mileage, I, I can't answer. I don't know. The other thing that you could consider too is POV use. It would be reduced rate. Um, you could, yeah, consider POV use and reduced rate. That's, that's another option. Adam says, for new rental agreement after 1 April, travelers should verify their department or agency's name is on the vehicle rental agreement for their reservation. All right. So it sounds like that thing might be out. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm going to get in there and take a look. Uh, up until an hour, two, about an hour and a half ago, I was not under the impression, did not know that rental agreement number four was going to change. So good information to have. Jonathan says, I wrecked my patrol vehicle on my way home from work because I fell asleep. I was not made to pay for any damage due to the heavy workload and long hours. Jonathan, that's what I was referring to as well, too, as far as workload, long hours. Uh, a scenario that happened to me, once again, at Elmendorf, a security forces member ran into an F-15. He fell asleep as well, too. Um, initially, they were going to hang this guy out to dry. But what ended up happening after they started looking into the amount of hours that he was working, 12-hour, um, 14, 16-hour days, go home for six and be back for another 12-hour, 14-hour, 16-hour day. He didn't get in trouble. His leadership did because they obviously let him down in that case. In your case, I'm glad you didn't have to pay for anything. Thanks for doing what you do, and, and I'm hoping, sure hope that you were not hurt. Thanks, Jonathan. Christine says, there is no longer a guard's charge on rental vehicles. The contract must say Department of Interior on the agreement. Okay, Christine, if you've got some time, can you shoot me an email so it's better when I have someone who knows this stuff better than me? And I'll tell you, I'm ignorant on a lot of that stuff. So if I can get a professional, someone who deals with it that's more than me so I can understand it, I will take and, and update that uh, in, in our presentation. So thank you, Christine. Thomas says, if I drive a GOV from one duty station to another and my home is halfway between and five miles off that route, can I drive the GOV to my home to sleep overnight? Uh, Thomas, that's home to work use. You can if you have the authority. You can if you have the approval. So how do you go about doing it? All right. So you stay duty station. I'm assuming your Department of Defense. You would have to get the home, home to work use approved by whatever service secretary you have. It can be approved. Be pretty hard in this case. Tracy says, in my opinion, Tracy says, my unit, we utilize the short-term rental program. What documentation do you need to show that the vehicle is insured? Um, there, I, so I don't get on the short-term rental uh, site at all. I'm willing to bet that there's something there, but I don't know. Tracy, send me an email if you can with the same question, and we'll get you in in contact with the short-term rental folks. And, and we'll both learn something of what you need, okay? <clears throat> Lorraine says, if I personally rent a vehicle, can I call it a POV for the purpose of mileage reimbursement? Um, I cannot answer that. I don't know for sure. That's something that I would talk with your travel folks about. And 
um, and ask them because, you know, it, it's not a POV. You don't own the vehicle, but you are renting the vehicle. And I don't know if there's any other legal implications there. I couldn't tell you. Uh, yeah. That's that's it. Sorry. And Kevin says domicile to work is congressional tact item reported and IRS benefit if approved. Yes, that home to work is for those that are recurring and, and, and doing it normally. And in some cases, incidental use that I talked about may be. But when I read it, the way I understand it, in most cases, us doing the incidental use, say, to a restaurant or things like that, when you're on a, say, a day trip or whatnot, is not is not taxable. <clears throat> Marvin says. Do you speak to police and give a statement if you're in an accident? Um, why wouldn't you? If you have a GSA vehicle, there is a kit in that vehicle, and it tells you what to do. It tells you what to do. Okay? Um, take a look at it. There's, there's good information there, Marvin, about what you should, what you should not do. Simon says, a GOV employee parks their POV inside of the gated GOV pool. When they pick up, they reserve GOV for official business. Upon return to years later, they discover someone had backed into their POV and caused damage to the front end. Who's responsible for damage? Uh, so basically what Simon is saying is that you know, a, a POV is in a GOV area. Um, you know, Unfortunately, in this case, it sounds like to me, Simon, that the POV is on the hook because if – the person didn't leave any information. Who are you going to go after? If there's no cameras, are you going to find them? Um, is it official for that person? Are they authorized to park in that space? If they're not allowed, um, yeah, if they're not allowed, then maybe, you know, they shouldn't have been in there in the first place. So that's the best I got for you. I know it's not great, but that's the best I got for you. All right, I got Kurt with an update with the GARS. He says, beginning April 1st, 2024, rental agreement number five will go into effect. $5 a day GARS charge will be removed when renting vehicles and approved rental companies will offer the same benefits to travelers expect, except at lower rates. Kurt, same to you. If you can get in contact with me, shoot me an email. You, you, based on what you're telling me there, you understand this a lot better than I do, and I would appreciate it if I could talk to you. Kiwana says, if I'm authorized home to work and I have a medical emergency driving between home and work, can I drive myself to the nearest ER? <clears throat> um, why not? And I'm seriously asking you, why not? If you have a medical emergency that you need to get to the emergency room, get there. Okay? The other part is if it's that serious, pull over and call 911. Get yourself into a safe space. Call 911. There, I do not foresee anyone, although I'm sure it could happen, someone who would get all bent out of shape because you went to the emergency room and, and, and something happened on your way because you were going because you say you had an, an allergic reaction. Wendy says, is there a type of insurance that I can purchase that will cover me if I get into an accident while driving a government car and I am liable for the accident? So Wesley, I'm sorry, Wesley says, um, if you're driving a GOV and you're at fault and you're within the scope of your employment, you're covered by the Federal Tort Claims Act. You're not responsible for third party. You could be responsible for the government vehicle. So in that case, what I I'll just pass on what I could get with State Farm, it's called other owned vehicle. I could get a policy that would protect me for wrecking a other person's own vehicle, uh, meaning like the government vehicle. It wouldn't normally just fall under my uh, regular insurance unless I have this rider. So for me, it would cost um, <clears throat> it, it would cost I think twenty six bucks for six months, twenty six dollars for six months. Ask, ask what it would do, or ask what it would cost. And there was a, a question that actually just went away. If they have follow up questions, uh, can they contact me? Absolutely, contact me. My email Devin .beckus at gsa gov. And uh, for those of you that have actually helped add to this. With the GARS fee, thank you very much for that information. Thanks for the updated information. Uh, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to post this one, even with my coughing fit that I was muted on, because that GARS stuff is very, very important to get out. Okay, so um, yeah, we'll get that that GARS information out there. And, and, and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, it's just this is a busy time. We'll have it updated, and it's going to be uh, in next 
next year's presentation. Uh, Kenneth says, regarding the guards change, do travelers have any coverage or does this mean travelers now have to purchase insurance at the rental counter? Kenneth, I don't know because I have not read this yet. Matter of fact, like I was saying, I just learned about this today in the last hour. So once again, thank you for the folks that pointed it out to me. I greatly appreciate it. And Jose says, will training be recorded and posted? This training is being recorded, Jose, and this one is going to be posted. This one is going to be posted because of the information about the GARS fee. So thank you. All right, folks, there's still 731 of you out there listening to me. If you have any more questions, throw them in the question and answer box. I'll answer them. If it's anything you know unique to you that you want me to talk about, uh, send me an email. I'll give you a call back or I'll get in contact with you by email. But we'll stick around just for a little bit. Oh, Christine has rental contract change highlights. And I'm going to click on that spreadsheet. There we go. Okay, Christine sent out that information. Christine, thank you so very much to everyone. Man, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. I, I kind of get excited when someone shows me something new. I do like it. And Christine, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. She, she's sending out stuff on rental car agreement number five, effective one April, 2024. Oh, okay. So uh, since everyone's on here, everyone, I, I'm, I've got it here. Big news, GARS is being eliminated. Agreement number five brings the elimination of the $5 per day government administrative rate supplement, GARS. When picking up rental vehicles booked under the new agreement, travelers should look for their department or agency's name on the agreement to ensure the reservation falls under the agreement. Travelers can expect all the same benefits of the previous agreement with 30% lower maximum allowable rates, including... No fee for collision damage waiver and loss damage waiver. No additional fee for liability coverage. If size and class of vehicle reserved is not available, rental company must offer a vehicle of equal or greater cars, car class at no cost. Unlimited mileage, except for one-way rentals. No underage driver fee for travelers 21 or older. No fee for additional authorized drivers. No blackout or minimum rental periods. Christine, you are my favorite today. I, I mean, everyone who's here is still my favorite. But I thank you so very much for sharing that with me. You taught me something new. Okay. Brittany says, do you know when gas vehicles are going to change to electric? It's happening now. Um, I, I, I do like electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are great. They're a good tool. They need to be put in the right places. So for me in central Pennsylvania and north, not a whole lot of infrastructure, but a Plug-in hybrid electric vehicle would be really good. Alaska, same thing. Not a whole lot of infrastructure up there. Not real good. So, um, yeah, it, it's 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 changing. It's happening. Uh, a little bit of paradigm shift, but uh, all good. All right, Susan yeah. says. Sorry, Devin. I just yeah. wanted to chime in with that a little bit too on the electric vehicles. You know, GSA is getting electric vehicles on on the contract kind of as soon as they're becoming readily, you know, publicly available from manufacturers. Um, there are, are some segments where, you know, there's a good amount of availability. There are other segments where there's just not yet. So it kind of depends on what type of vehicle you have. Um how soon that may shift over. Um, all of the requirements related to electric vehicles uh, that are in the executive orders are based off of your new acquisitions. So once those kick in, and I think it's 2027 and 20, I forget the years, but th those are based off of what is being acquired in those years what are the new purchases so it's not saying that your entire inventory has to to shift over um so a, just a couple of things in relation a couple of additional things in relation to to evs there thank you stacy i appreciate it <clears throat> okay so would there be charging stations installed it can take a long time to charge an ev so there's places where charging stations are going to be 
installed. There's places where they're not yet. Yes, it does take a long time for a regular um, regular 110 outlet to charge a vehicle. And you know, it, it, is it cart, horse, chicken, egg? It's a paradigm shift and it's a changing technology. So, and, and as things grow and we get better, we're gonna have six, 700 mile ranges on a single battery charge. It's, it's we're gonna get there. We just gotta take this step. Jose says, don't put EVs in states with no infrastructure or lots of snow. Alternative fuel vehicles are still better yet. Um, I, and, and you know, th th there, there's places where they're good. There's places where they're not good. Um, and it, it's something that we're learning as well, too. Susan says, also, will GSA be installing charging stations in federal buildings with parking? Um, <clears throat> Susan, maybe. It, it, that is actually a PBS function. So that is something that PBS is working and whatnot now. So they are, it's just, it's taking time and there's some places that may not do it. Kevin says, we got charging station installed in military installation and a waiver to acquire hybrid versus full EVs. Yeah, it, Kevin, I'm not sure what agency you work for. Um, it's, that's a good mix. Uh, we actually, our, our current dispatch vehicle, my office vehicle is a plug-in hybrid. We get 50 miles on the battery and then the gas engine kicks over. I went on a trip today and I got um, most of the trip, I think 3.2 miles of my trip was done on the engine and not the battery. So for most of the trips we take fairly locally, that's good. And when I go on longer trips up to Scranton, like I was talking about, I've got the gasoline to back me up. Now, unique to this, what I have been learning, and we have a, a Mitsubishi. Even though the battery shows no miles available, it will still kick into hybrid mode with regenerative braking. So it's 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 pretty cool to see. I I like that part of the plug-in hybrid. So thanks, Kevin, for that. I appreciate it. All right. So we don't have any more questions. There's still 613. Yeah, I appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, once again, shout out to Christine. Thank you, and everyone who told me about rental agreement number five. Um, I thank you. You're going to make this a better, even better presentation come next year. So I appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> Jeannie says, Christine is my favorite today too. <laughs> thank you, everyone. For those, that, thank you for the very kind comments. I, I do enjoy teaching this class. And if I ever turn my camera on, you would just see this guy just flailing his arms around as I'm talking about this stuff. It's 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 fun, enjoyable. Uh, so Kathy says, can you print your certificate now? Kathy, very soon you're going to get that email. It should come out today. If not today, it'll come out tomorrow. And then you can print it out and uh, and and do it. Uh, put your name on it. If you have anyone watching with you, they can do the same thing. All right. I'm done. Joseph and Stacy, thank you so much for your help again. Thank you. I really appreciate you all. Thank you, Devin, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's desktop workshop. As a reminder, the slides are posted already on the desktop workshop website, and a recording will be posted there as well. You'll be receiving an email with your certificates by COB. Have a good day, everyone.